in this podcast, I would like uh, to study the treaty between Great Britain and Ireland. Uh, it was signed at London in uh, December 6th, in 1921. So it was a treaty just after the war. It was signed also by Churchill from the English side. So it's important to know it and to understand it. From the Irish side, it was signed, of course, by uh, Michael Collins or Michael Collyne, as they said in Ireland. I think so. The treaty has several points which are important. I would like to emphasize on some points only. I would like to start with uh, Article 1. So Ireland shall have the same constitutional status in the community of nations known as the British Empire as the Dominion of Canada the Commonwealth of Australia, the Dominion of New Zealand, and the Union of South Africa. We have Irish Free State. It should be totally independent, but in your reality, the articles of this treaty create, in fact, a dependence. So, if we want to see it very officially, we can read the Article 4, and in fact, the statement which is mentioned in the following form that the members of the Parliament of the Irish Free State should use the following oath. So they should say, I, with their name, do solemnly swear to faith and allegiance to the constitution of the Irish Free State as by law established, and this is a point which is important, that I will be faithful to Her Majesty King George V. So it's already a problem because it's not exactly an independence. Uh, they should do the same thing with the successors by law. But the explanation is rather strange because they mentioned that this is due to the fact that in virtue of the common citizenship of Ireland with Great Britain, they should do this, but also her adherence to a membership of the group of nations forming the British Commonwealth of Nations. So why it is strange? Because you don't need the last point, uh, even as an argument, but they use it. They use it to show that it was a necessity to do it, but in fact, no. So for me, it's already a problem. We can see another problem in the Article 5, uh, where the Irish Free State shall assume the ability for the service of the public debt of the United Kingdom as existing at the date of, of and toward the payment of war pensions and existing at that date in such proportion as may be fair and equitable, having regard to any just claims on the part of Ireland by way of state of or counterclaim, the amount of such sums being determined in default of agreement by the arbitration of one or more independent persons being citizens of the British Empire. So this is another problem because they should do this. And in fact, it's only the public debt of the United Kingdom so they have to do something also about that. We have also the Article 6 about the coastal defense. 
So let's read it. Until an arrangement has been made between the British and Irish governments, whereby the Irish Free State undertakes a own coastal defense, the defense by sea of Great Britain and Ireland shall be undertaken by His Majesty's Imperial Forces. So you see that it's an independent state, free state, but not exactly at this moment, because for the defense, they should use, in fact, the imperial forces. Another point of the Article 7. The government of the Irish Free State shall afford to His Majesty's imperial forces what? Two point. A. In time of peace, such harbor and other facilities as are indicated in the annex here too, or such other facilities as may from time to time be agreed between the British government and the government of Irish Free State. And the second point, B, in time of war or of strained relations with a foreign power, such harbor and other facilities as the British government may require for the purposes of such defense as aforesaid. So you see two points, one for the peace, one for the war. It's important to see that the British government still have the right to use them freely without any counterpart about that. So it's written in the Article 7. It's not exactly what we mean when we say an Irish free state. So it looks more like an Irish dependent state. And it's normal for the Great Britain, but not for Ireland. And it's normal, I mean, it's normal to, to forecast some problems like the civil war, because it's not clear. You are independent, but not exactly. You can do what you want, but not exactly. In any case, I, the British part, can do what I want. The Article 10, the government of the Irish Free State agrees to pay fair compensation on terms not less favorable than those according by the Act of 1920 to judges, officials, members of police forces, and other public servants who are discharged by it or who retire in consequence of the change of government affected in pursuance herefore. So you see that they have to pay persons which are defined by the Act of 1920. Maybe in another podcast we should study also this Act. The most problematic part for me is the Article 11. So there is a mention there on the following also of the Northern Ireland. So we have a treaty between two countries. They say something. We don't care about that for the moment. But in the Article 11, they explain that there is a problem and um, we have to take care about that, is the situation in Northern Ireland. So why, for me, it is important? Because the British part said, what? You are a free state. You can do what you want. Except, except in Northern Ireland. So the decision is rather complicated to understand it 
in the following words, because I think that at that moment, they wanted just to shift the problem, to put the problem one month after, to solve the problem of the treaty, to give a design of the treaty to be rather fair. So you can do it, you can sign, but with exceptions. And one of these exceptions starts in Article 11. Until the expiration of one month from the passing of the Act of Parliament for the ratification of this instrument, the powers of the Parliament and the government of the Irish Free State shall not be exercisable as respects Northern Ireland. So they can't do anything, at least for one month. And the provision of the government of Ireland Act 1920 shall, so far, as they relate to Northern Ireland, remain of full force and effect. And no election shall be held for the return of members to serve in the Parliament of the Irish Free State for constituencies in Northern Ireland, unless a resolution is passed by both houses of the Parliament of Northern Ireland in favor of the holding of such elections before the end of the said month. So they can't do anything for one month. They will use the previous act of 1920. And for me, this exception permits what? Northern Ireland has the right in reality to say, I don't want to be in that state. So we are studying right now a treaty between two countries, but one of them at the end of the process could be two countries. Not exactly two, because one part will belong to the previous one. So you see, we have A and B, but B has two parts, B1 and B2. And in fact, B2 has a choice to belong to A. British diplomacy. Article 12. If before the expiration of the said month, an address is presented to His Majesty by both houses of the Parliament of Northern Ireland to that effect, the powers of the Parliament and government of the Irish Free State shall not longer extend to Northern Ireland. Island. So it's clear if the Northern Island says now, I don't want this, the Irish Free State cannot control this area. And the provision of the Government of Ireland Act 1920 including those relating to the Council of Ireland, shall so far as they relate to Northern Ireland continue to be a full force and effect, and this instrument shall have effect subject to the necessary modifications. So it's clear. Now the process. Because in, in reality is not so clear, <laughs> They have to define how to do this. So they say, provided that if such an address is so presented, you see the sentence, if such an address is so presented. So they write this 
just as a potential issue. But it was clear that there will be a problem. A commission consisting of three persons want to be appointed by the government of the Irish Free State all the time we start with the Irish Free State. Want to be appointed by the government of Northern Ireland, so it's the same. And one who shall be chairman, so the most important, to be appointed by the British government. In fact, we had something like this also in 2004 in Cyprus. So I continue. Shall determine in accordance with the wishes of the inhabitants so far as may be compatible with economic and geographic condition, the boundaries between Northern Ireland and the rest of Ireland. So, why they do not mention that this will be the new frontiers between two states? They just stay the boundaries. But in reality, you know it now, due to history, this will be the end of what? Of the Irish Free State and the beginning of the Great Britain. It's not just a boundary. Okay? It's not just a green line. Just to be clear. Another point which is important. It doesn't seem important, but in reality, there is already a mention in the Article 13, and we should say something about that. For the purpose of the last foregoing article, the powers of the Parliament of Southern Ireland. And now they don't say Irish Free State. They say Southern Ireland. Under the Government of Ireland Act 1920, so the previous one, to elect members of the Council of Ireland shall, after the Parliament of the Irish Free State is constituted, be exercised by the Parliament. So, why there is this kind of mention? For me, is a way to put an equilibrium between the two parts of Ireland. So we are starting um, with the Irish Free State, and now, of the Article 13, we have this kind of mention, and we will have the same kind of mention in the Article 15. Just to be sure that is not an error. Article 15. At any time after the date hereof, the government of Northern Ireland and the provisional government of Southern Ireland, herein after, constituted may meet for the purpose of discussing the provisions subject to which the last foregoing, foregoing article is to operate in the event of no such address as is therein mentioned being presented and those provisions may include. So it's not only about the safeguard, but also the problem of minorities in Northern 
pylon, which is a cute mention, you see? The minorities in Northern Ireland. You can imagine, for example, the minorities in occupied territories of one state. So the last point is the establishment and powers of a local militia in Northern Ireland and the relation of defense forces of the Irish Free State and of Northern Ireland, respectively. And the point is, and if at any such meeting provision are agreed to, the same shall have effect as if they were included among the provisions subject to which the powers of the Parliament and Government of Irish Free State are to be exercisable in Northern Ireland under Article 14 hereof. So, you see that, in fact, there, there will be some negotiation and discussion after the signature, okay? But the result will be incorporated in the treaty with the Article 14. So, you can understand now that they give, in reality, too much power to the Northern Ireland. So, it's not a treaty between A and B. Is a treaty between A and B1, but A will do things with B2 against B1, but not by A. So, in reality, you have only the preparation of a little proxy war, which will become what? A civil war. But it will not be the fault of the British Empire because they signed the treaty. Okay, so you see that it's clear that is not clear and they will use it. So each part B1, B2, or A will use it and say what? For me, the interpretation of this article is this. For the other, it's not the same. But in reality, all the treaty has problem, and not only problem as a treaty, but problems like seeds of problems. So everything is done to have problems in the next step. So you remember the idea of Clemenceau, we are not signing treaties to end wars, but to start the next. And you can see that it's correct even for that, because we will have the problem in the following year. With the independence, of course, but the civil war together. So, a last point. To avoid to bother you. So the Article 17, there is again a mention of the administration of Southern Ireland. Okay, at the beginning of the Article 17. The important part is, of course, the last sentence, but this arrangement shall not continue in force beyond 
the expiration of 12 months from the date before. So the date you remember was December 6th, 1921, and we will use it. And you can see again, another mention of Southern Ireland in the last article, article 18, this instrument shall be submitted forthwith by His Majesty's Government for the approval of Parliament and by the Irish signatories to meetings for morning for the purpose of the members elected to sit in the House of Commons of Southern Ireland and if approved shall be ratified by the necessary legislation. So you, you see that everything is done for that. We can see also at the end, the annex is about specific facilities for harbors, okay? They will be used in the next time, and especially in the Second World War. So it's an important thing. Now, we can say what? We can say that in reality with this treaty, which was signed also by Winston Churchill, is clear that the empire wants to keep the control of this area. So maybe it's not the Irish free state for the Britons. Maybe it's the Irish free area in their mind. So I can do something there is not exactly mine, but I can do everything as it was still mine. So in fact, it's mine. And now if you relate this to the decision of June 1940, when Churchill sent MacDonnell to say to the Irish people, if you are in the war with us against Nazis, then the partition, the partition of Ireland will remove the same person. Okay, as you can see in the treaty, you can't find the word partition. So they don't say it, but they designed it. So the important part in strategy is to say or to design. Of course, to design. You don't need to say that. But in reality, you create the problem and the problem will follow just in the next step. So I wanted to study this point to make it clear that it was normal after this treaty to have a proxy war, which was interpreted as a civil war, but in reality, it was just the forcing consequence of the treaty. That's all.